welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm your host, Henry Arslanian, and welcome to this other episode of the Future of Money podcast. Before we start, I want to say a big thank you to the half million of you who follow my content each week. This podcast, The Future of Money, is now ranked in the top 5% of all podcasts globally on Spotify. There's literally thousands of you each week from over 160 countries tuning in. So a big thank you from the bottom of my heart for all your support. As all you loyal listeners know, my goal with this podcast is very simple. It's to go deep in some of the biggest ideas, trends, and developments we are seeing in the field of crypto, and hopefully empower you with this information, and then let you make your own decision on what their impact can be on the future of money and the future of finance. To do this, I invite each week one of the leading figures of the global crypto community to have this one-on-one conversation amongst crypto aficionados and discuss some of these topics. Today, I'm very excited because we're launching this new series called the Investor Series, where we're going to discuss a broad range of topics related broadly to the topic of investing crypto, from risk management to due diligence. And hopefully, you'll be able to hear from some of the leading experts around the world on what to watch out for, and hopefully some tips when it comes to to empowering you with some of the latest trends uh, on what to know and what to not do when it comes to investing in crypto. Uh, today, my guest is John Ward. He's a managing di- director on the Alternative Assets Advisory Team at Kroll. One thing you may not know about John, he's an avid gil- golfer. He lives in South Carolina. And despite uh, his handicap of 18, he claims he's not a very good golfer. I tend to disagree with that, John. But hey, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, Henry. Yeah, um, working all time is uh, is not uh, very good for your golf handicap, but uh, there's uh, time for that when retirement comes about. Uh, exactly. You know, it's funny. It's one of the, the the sports I find if you're lucky enough to start when you're young, a man, the the, the, the skills you gain from that perspective are quite a uh, quite interesting. As long as it, a lot of it topics, makes all the difference in the world. Uh, exactly. That's so, you know, my my daughter, a seven year old daughter, and uh, I spend literally time with her. I bring her to the try to bring her to the golf course every Sunday, so she starts uh, learning the ropes pretty pretty early. Uh, today, so we're going to talk about a lot of exciting topics, John. Really, uh, we're going to deep dive on the in, on the what on the due diligence side, uh, not only on counterparties when it comes to crypto, but also on some of the funds and what are some of the elements that we need to look at. Uh, before we start, I want to make my usual disclosure uh, for those of you uh, uh, that follow the show regularly. You know that, but John works at Kroll, which is a firm that's involved in various vertical of the crypto industry, from doing due diligence to uh, doing insolvencies of some of the recent players that went down, and Kroll may be involved in, in, in uh, due diligence or other activities with companies that I'm involved in. Uh, for example, Nine Blocks, the hedge fund where I'm a partner, or other uh, current or past sponsors of the show as well. So just want to make put that disclosure out uh, from, the, from the start as well. John, before we kick in, can you maybe share with the audience a bit more about your background? Like, how did you end up getting into crypto due diligence and so that audience can know who you are? Sure. Uh, appreciate it. So uh, I uh, came out through the asset management industry, worked in trading um, and an asset uh, manager and an asset advisor, a long only manager through much of the, the 1990s, moved into the hedge fund uh, environment in 2001, uh, eventually became uh, chief financial and, uh, and uh, administrative officer at Nomura's alternative asset business, NFR and TA. Uh, overseeing um, the growth of the alternative business within Nomura that handled uh, private equity, it handled uh, long only, it handled hedge funds and fund of funds, and then uh, some other uh, products, uh, real estate, timber. So it, it, we built, we started building the operational due diligence program there at Nomura in the early aughts around 2006 or seven. I think we were one of the first folks that were out doing operational due diligence. It started obviously in the hedge fund space. Um, and then we started doing the same type of work uh, on private equity, uh, forest and timber, timber, um, real estate development, real estate funds. So we, we were part of the group that, that was probably doing this, that type of analysis long before most others. Uh, I, I moved to a, a long uh, to a uh, fund of funds shop, uh, EIM and Gotex, um, that was mostly focused on funds of hedge funds, and then I moved over to Kroll in 2017. Um, when the IMDDA, the Investment Management Due Diligence Association, was formed, I was asked to be a part of the organization, and as one of the founding board members, um, I took uh, the opportunity to, to teach a number of the classes about how to do operational due diligence. And it was through that process that people were coming to me and saying, "Hey, we're we're considering this new asset class of digital assets. What are your thoughts on it?" And I probably had the deer in the headlights uh, look, and this was in 2000. 
probably early 2017, and I took about six to nine months uh, to to really dig into it and understand it. And I think I wrote one of the earliest white papers on the the areas of risk and concern in late 2017, early 2018. It was published around doing operational due diligence on digital asset funds. So that was really the start. It goes back about now about six years or so, six, seven years ago is where we first got started in it. That's amazing. Well, actually, before we kick in about some of the areas of risk that you mentioned in the crypto space, can you maybe share for our audience what is ODD, what is operation due diligence, especially when it relates to digital assets? Generally, operational due diligence is the review of the operational infrastructure. So that's everything other than portfolio management. Um, and and what are the uh, potential risks that may exist in how a GP or a fund manager is managing the fund, its environment, um, and all the risks that they are taking in managing the portfolio that could uh, potentially have a negative impact on the investor's experience. So, for instance, uh, if they are uh, very lax in their cash controls and it turns out that one of the employees uh, through a series of fraud starts stealing money that obviously would have an, a very negative impact to the investors of that fund. So the operational due diligence looks at everything other than portfolio management and compares it to industry standards and trends and best practices and tries to identify the risks that an investor is subject to but not being compensated for. Obviously, their, their investment experience is going to be limited to the investment experience of the portfolio management. So a 10% return uh, on, on a portfolio is what they're going to earn. But if they're taking massive risks in the operations because the manager is really poorly uh, managed and and, and uh, led, then their risk uh, profile, they're getting a 10% return, but they may be actually taking materially more risk to get that return. And no one would be comfortable taking um, a lot of risk to get only a modest return. And, but how do you see uh, due diligence, and in particular uh, operational due diligence, be different in digital assets compared to traditional finance? So digital assets, uh, at least at this time, is a wholly separate environment. So there are a few service providers and counterparties who cross over between the, let's say, the traditional alternatives – hedge funds and private equity funds and venture capital funds and that type of thing, and the crypto space. But it's very few, and, and it's, it's going to change over time. But, but uh, in its early days, um, the administrators who, who were the administrators for the funds were unique to the space and did very little in traditional alternatives. Um, most of the auditors were, were relatively unique to the space. The trading counterparties, the CFI and DeFi exchanges, everything – about it is a different environment. Perhaps the only area of commonality is some of the listed futures on the you know, CBOE and CME. Those are two obviously marketplaces that most uh, alternatives managers are, are familiar with. But it is, it is a unique investing experience with unique counterparties and service providers. And therefore, an investor needs to spend time not only understanding the investment process, but taking the time to understand and do due diligence on a whole host of, of counterparties and service providers. Yeah, and you raise a very good point, John, because actually you're right. If I think about the crypto ecosystem, there's very few of the traditional finance providers who are very active in the digital asset space. Some of them, like you said, are involved in both, but actually there's many that are crypto native service providers that somebody who's just been involved in traditional finance would have never heard of, right? Which is very, very interesting uh, from, from that Some of the traditional guys are buying up some of those unique <laughs> uh, businesses. We've seen um, traditional alternative um, fund administration groups buying some of the early movers, so they are diversifying, and, and some of the earliest movers have been snapped up. But again, uh, there's only a few, a couple of auditors that, that audit all types of funds that are involved in crypto uh, and the same way fund administrators, custodians, most of them are un unique to the space because it's a unique asset class. Yeah. So I think the, um, let's dive right in because obviously I would argue that pre FTX uh, due diligence was important uh, for, especially for some more of the sophisticated investors, but for many, many, many people out there, it was an afterthought. Right? And of course, FTX ch completely changed the game. From your perspective and your practical experience, right? When you look at a pre-FTX and a post-FTX world, what are the, the major changes that you've seen on a due diligence perspective? Let's start with a positive way and then obviously some that are areas that still need improvement. So 
Operational diligence, um, most of our early work was institutional allocators of one type or another who were interested in making the investment into some type of a fund vehicle that was that was focused on digital assets. Um, there were very few, it was usually either all digital or no digital early on. Uh, we didn't see people blending traditional and uh, traditional alts and digital, perhaps the way we do now. So some type of an investor looking to do some type of a due diligence analysis of a fund before considering their investment. When we met with the manager, we would ask, well, how did you select your counterparties? How did you select your service providers? And often it was, look, there's only one or two games in town. I have to be with one of them. In the very early days, you didn't have that many choices. As time went on, and soon there was an explosion of CFI and eventually um, DeFi uh, counterparties, we would again ask the same questions. Well, how are you picking your counterparties? What work are you doing? What due diligence are you doing? And we repeatedly heard um, not a lot. There was there was only limited amounts of, hey, I know somebody there. They're really good. They have the products I need. They have the pricing I need. And therefore, we're going to work with them. So the earliest days of, of digital assets, the managers were um, almost a captured audience that they had relatively few choices who to use in counterparty service providers and custodians. And now we're seeing through the maturation of the environment, um, there's more opportunity, but that now means that the managers need to do more due diligence when selecting their counterparties and service providers. And then that, of course, funnels back to the, um, to the allocator. Wait a minute, it's not just how this manager is controlled and how they're doing their business, but who their service providers are. Let's be honest, most people right now, if you see Goldman Sachs, Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley, UBS, um, most people say, look, I don't, I don't need to do due diligence on them. I've heard of all those companies. They're going to survive. That's not necessarily the case in, this, in the digital asset space because some of them are unique companies that they don't have large balance sheets to withstand a, a storm. So let's go let's go and deep dive on some of these verticals you mentioned, yep. right? So if if somebody's looking at allocating into a fund, for example, and you want to make sure the manager has done due diligence on the counterparties in the crypto ecosystem, right? Let's talk about some of the things they should look out for, right? Some of the big areas. What are the, I'd say that the, the two or three big areas of focus that you think are essential for anybody do, do, doing due diligence on a crypto counterparty? Well, um, I'll, I'll give you a few bullet points, and, and some of them are going to be difficult uh, because it's the environment. So very few um, – any organization choosing to do due diligence, it can't be a once a one-time event. You have to go and you have to do the due diligence on the organization, and you have to monitor and follow up. You can't just – Go once, have a two-hour meeting, and then you're good for good for years and years. There's there's constant follow-up too. I would think you need to understand the financial health, the balance sheet uh, of, of the organization, and and their business lines. Are they doing anything that you that you are unaware of? Um, and that sort of goes to FTX and people didn't necessarily understand all their businesses they were in. Um, three would be um, an understanding of what are their what's behind them, what what. Um, Again, the balance sheet. Do they have other owners? Do they have other resources to cash and capital? Um, what is their ownership structure? What is their profitability? Do they issue audited financial statements so that you can understand, is this place operating at a loss? Is it operating um, at a profit? And where are those? what's happening with those profits? A very profitable counterparty who's choosing to use all their profits to make um, uh additional agency trading on their own uh, of their own uh, profits, trying to make more money on money could very easily make a bad trade and blow up the whole firm. So how, what are they doing? Are they doing prop capital investing? What are they doing so that you understand your risk environment? Then you have to look at, do their systems work? Do the controls work? Do they have a CCO and a general counsel? Um, do they, are they have cybersecurity and on? I mean, there's, we, we could go through a whole host of elements, but it's not just who they are, where they're located, and what are their fees. Um, there is a lot of work that has to be done, and we're doing that for certain clients who want to really understand. We did, um, I can't name names, but we looked at a, at a custodian of, of crypto assets, and it's a name that I knew when we were first uh, asked to do the work. I immediately knew who they were, uh, so it, it, is, it is not an obscure organization. 
But we were surprised to find out that the vast majority of their revenues and vast majority of their profits are really coming from trading, having nothing to do with custody. And in fact, custody was less than 10% of their headcount and 10% of, of their, their revenues. So the thought that most people had about them is they are crypto custodian, but truthfully, the vast majority of their revenues and their profits are coming from non-custody businesses, which leads one to believe that that's all well and good. Again, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but you need to do the due diligence. You need to understand that. So when you consider them as a custodian, that you're making a decision based on all the facts, just not an impression of what they do. But to the defense of many in the crypto community, right? Because if you go right now, let's use FTX as an example. If a normal fund or even an individual or a trader would go to FTX and say, hey, FTX, I want to do due diligence on your financial health. It's very unlikely they would have been given any information. So what what, what advice do you have for any any individuals or even firms looking at doing some, as part of the due diligence, looking at the financial head halt or that, or that counterparty when these companies are private companies and they're not necessarily going to be forthcoming with releasing their, their financial information? Well, I think what you're seeing is sort of where the hedge fund industry was 15 or 20 years ago, that in, in the early aughts, um, call it from the late 1990s to 2000 and prior to the, the Madoff crisis, if you went to a fund administrator and asked them a lot of questions about how they do and what they do, they, they would not have been responsive. Um, the same way, uh, even today, most auditors will not confirm that they have been retained as an auditor because they feel that that is some top secret thing that if they tell you, they have to kill you, um, which I still don't understand. Uh, but th that's where we were in the early aughts and then Madoff happens and suddenly everybody had to open the kimono a little bit more and say, all right, we'll tell you more about how we do business. I personally think that's what the impact of FTX is going to be. The idea that says we are a CFI exchange, we don't tell you anything. We're an auditor. We don't tell you anything. We're an administrator. We don't tell you anything. I think those days are largely gone and they're going to have a hard time attracting um, institutional fund managers. Um, the same way if I came into you and your fund and said, hey, I need to do ODD. And you'd say, here's my offering document. That's all I'm telling you. Either invest or walk away. Most people are going to walk away. Absolutely. And I think it's interesting, uh, John, because uh, out of my own personal experience, I've definitely seen the, exchange, the centralized exchanges definitely open up more uh, since FTX. It's been complete 180, actually. I remember back in the day in 08 when Lehman happened and the banks and the hedge funds started opening up. Uh, and of course, with, uh, with, the, uh, with uh, Madoff as well. I think it's been very interesting, the evolution of uh, centralized crypto platform in the last couple of months. That's sort of the one of the unique things about digital that, that that I guess is, to me personally, professionally, is somewhat disappointing that there seems to be a lot of managers in the digital asset space who think that their environment is so unique, so different, so special that they don't have anything to learn from the hedge fund environment of traditional assets. So the cash controls that, that have taken years and years and years to put in place at, at a traditional uh, hedge fund – that is the same types of, of controls that should be in place at a digital hedge fund, a digital focused hedge fund. But yet there's so many hedge fund managers in the digital space who, who seem that they haven't learned much from, from the past. And I'm hopefully that, that learning curve will accelerate. And of course, and everybody, everybody would benefit from that as well. Let's talk about cash controls on, on a financial side. So for example, if we, if an allocator is listening today and they want to invest in a fund or invest in a crypto business, what questions should they ask when it comes to cash controls and what are the red flags they should look out for? Well, I'll start with the red flags um, and, and then we'll work our way back towards um, institutionalization. And, and I tend to put things like, all right, they're seriously bad. Then there's good, better, best. So a, a manager who's paying all of their bills themselves, wiring out money um, to pay their bills or God forbid, writing anybody who's writing checks to pay a bill, walk away. If anybody, you say, tell me how you write a bill, and they say our CFO pulls out a checkbook and writes a check like you do for your home electric bill, walk away. They're not institutional. Um, but I have seen that. Uh, not in crypto, but in, in the traditional space. So, so if they're wiring money and the controls are completely within the manager and it's one person sign off and one person can release money, they're far from institutional. That Those generally are all failing levels of control. What you ideally see is they, they use the term a four eyes concept, meaning that two people are, are reviewing the bills, approving the bills, two people are involved in releasing the money. That is a minimal standard. 
the, the next standard above that is the involvement of the fund administrator. So the manager says to the administrator, here's a bill that needs to be paid. We've approved it. Here's our signature on it. it it's good to go. Um, the manager will upload the payment through a wiring processing system. And, and the fund administrator releases it or vice versa. The administrator w- loads the wire up and the manager releases it. That there is not only two people within the fund manager, there's a third external entity, the fund administrator, or some type of a trustee or some type of a board member or some other uh, exogenous entity that has control. Those are the minimum standards if you want to be called institutional. And we can go deeper and deeper and deeper um, into that. Like we saw with Signature Bank and we saw with with Silvergate and stuff is now the diversification. You can't just have one banking institution. It sounds like it's being excessive, but we saw from those failures um, that you know we have to have a safe place where we can go to and move our money. So I think if you're going to call yourself an institutional fund manager, you have to have two banking relationships. And one of them maybe is one of the large global banks and, and the other is maybe a specialized bank. That's where we are now, unfortunately, is because of, of risk assets. Um, and with the threat or, or the storm clouds of a recession overhead, we can't be sure which financial institutions may get into trouble. Absolutely. And what about the people factor? Of course, when, if we think about FTX and other cases that we've had recently, at the end of the day, it's, it's a any even crypto business, a centralized crypto business, whether they're an exchange or a fund, there's that people element, right? How, as somebody who's doing due diligence, you try to measure the integrity or let's say the background of individuals involved in running these businesses, especially in crypto where maybe except funds, a lot of crypto businesses, the ownership or, of some of these crypto platforms are a bit uh, nebulous to, to be polite. Yeah, yeah, you're being kind. Um, <laughs> um, so a couple of things. If you're going to seriously try to do operational due diligence of some type, I would hope that you would, would choose an expert if you have internal experts. I think a lot of folks have a couple of their favorite, uh, I'm going to say trick questions, but questions that in order to answer the person responding has to have some level of technical expertise. So if you're talking to a chief compliance officer, you know, reference a certain rule, reference a certain regulator, reference something and ask them a pointed question about it. And if they can't answer the question or they give you a, a very wrong question or they admit to you, I have no idea what you're talking about, you're, you're starting to get an idea of what their technical level of knowledge is. So the person could have worked for the SEC for 20 years, but they might have overseen mutual funds their whole life. And now they're moving to a digital asset space. And if you ask them some questions around digital assets, around exchanges, around CFI, about custody, about whatever, and they look at you and they don't understand, you can get the impression that they know rules, but they don't know the environment. And that goes the same way for for controls around audit, around valuation, um, around all different types of structuring and law firms and administrators and how you do this or how you do that. You're trying to understand your people and where they are in their knowledge base. I will admit that the people that I meet from the investment side of the business and digital assets are some of the smartest people, the most energetic, um, the most forward looking uh, and truthfully exciting people to get to know. Um, The area, in my humble opinion, the areas that disappoint me tend to be more the operations in the back office because they seem to be focusing all of their their energy and, and their ideas on the front office and investment. And they just assume that they can hire almost a warm body to do the operations. And I think that's what that separates an institutional manager from a non-institutional manager is an institutional manager has put efforts into the front office and to the back office. Uh, and that's the biggest segregation, I think, between um, soon to be institutional and, and managers who are going to have a hard time attracting capital. Yeah. And it's also very challenging as well to hire people as well with the right operational ex- experience. I know, that, for example, in in the hedge fund that I'm involved in, our, our non-investment team is 50% bigger than the investment team, to put things in perspective, yeah. right? Because it's the complications. It's, of it's often balanced. And you said bigger. So there's a lot of organizations that have I make up a number: ten smart people in, in in managing the money, and ten or even twenty or even thirty people, as you said, in operations and finance and technology and, and all those areas that need to be done right. If you're a quant manager and you are therefore have a huge investment in software and hardware and technology and cloud operations and encryption and data, and, and you're looking and trying to verify, um, you know, the speed of your network. You're going to need a large, large number of people yeah. to do all that. Um, you can't 
I don't know how to do that with, you know, two people. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, you just can't do it the right way. And, and let's say when we take a practical example, like the FTX scenario, right? If, if I mean, obviously, there's been a lot of talks in the media how large institutions, I mean, some of them are public, like Temasek mentioned that they've done eight months of enhanced due diligence on FTX. Uh, other players as well, other pension funds who have made uh, investments at FTX men- mentioned similar numbers as well. From your perspective, of course, uh, hindsight is twenty twenty, right? But let's say when you looked at FTX as a business on elements like what you mentioned, you know, cash controls, people and the likes, what are some of the red flags you think that people should have spotted that they didn't spot back in the day? Cash controls. First of all, the FTX didn't have a bank account. So they were using, if I understand it, I I am not deeply knowledgeable at FTX. I'm not involved in my personally, I'm not involved in any expert witness stuff. I'm not involved in in any of that side of the business. But from reading the press reports, it sounds like they were relying on the uh, bank accounts of their trading entity for people wiring in money. So that would be a first um, concern is, do you know the name of the bank account? Do you know who they're using for the bank accounts? Do you know where the assets are? Number one. Number two is segregation of assets between the firm's assets and the client assets. If you're going to use any organization, you need to understand that if I deposit my crypto on that exchange with that second, uh, that, that OTC broker uh, on a swap transaction, whatever, who's holding my capital, who's holding my collateral, who's holding my coins. Um, and as you know, that, that term that people have heard, you know, n- you know, n- not your password, not your coins type of stuff. Um, you need to understand are the, are your assets being commingled with the assets of the organization? Um, those people who are in the U S know sec 15 C three, three, which is segregation of assets off the balance sheet of, of a prime broker. Um, and that's sort of what blew up with Lehman Brothers, obviously, is the commingling of the assets on the balance sheet. That, to me, is, is you need to understand when you're in custody, when they're holding your coins, are they your coins or are they the exchange's coins? And if they are the exchange's coins, what you need to now have a plan of now what? What happens if bad things happen? What are my choices? So therefore, you have to have a plan in place to constantly be taking assets off the exchange, sort of people sweep on ISDAs and things like that. People sweep uh, assets that are not planned on being used and pull them into some type of a custody relationship or put it inside of a walled garden or something. Because anybody who's doing due diligence on them for, I guess, for an equity investment in the business, these are basic questions that should have been asked, basically. Uh, on on the cash management side. I mean, then the other thing is, if you look at it, let's say at FTX as well, where, again, uh, based on the allegations that are made out there that literally uh, the books were cooked. I mean, not only the books were cooked, but it was literally backdoor uh, where a lot of these things were ha- taking place. What do you think, uh, again, hindsight is twenty twenty. but what do you think anybody was doing due diligence for some of these investors? What question could have they asked that would have actually spotted some of these backdoors that, that FTX had in place or allegedly had in place? Well, it's hard if you're getting lied to. Let, let's be. That, that you started earlier than saying, look, you know, the information is only as good as what you can get your hands on. But but apparently, a, a large number of people had uh, org charts about the organization and what the various pieces are. So the first question you start to uh, you need to understand is the the venture investments that Bankman Fried was making with naming rights and all these other businesses that he was doing. Where do they fall? And then what are the um, the Chinese walls that separate his venture type investments that he was making these very celebrity type things that he was doing, what segregates those. And for instance, his trading hedge fund, what are the Chinese walls between those two organizations? And that needs to be heavily, heavily investigated. Um, does, does his trading entity issue um, uh, audited financials? And if the answer is no, why not? Because, you know, obviously they were losing billions of dollars. Um, in, in trading, and they were dipping into customer assets or, or using, you know, the balance sheet of, of FTX to, to solve their problems. If you don't understand all the businesses on the org chart and what the relationships are and their interdependencies, and if you can't get uh, comfortable answers, um, I don't know how you invest. I don't know how you do business with them. I mean, the fact that, you know, obviously I've read all the FTX uh, documents afterwards uh, from uh, the, the, the liquidators afterwards. I mean, there's some things are quite, I mean, they're quite sad, but also funny how they're approving uh, expenses with emojis. Uh, but also some of the things are, I think for me, are very basic. Like there was no board and there was no board uh, meetings and no board minutes. 
how important is there that? There were literally no grownups in the room because they were all a bunch of whatever, 20 and 30 year olds. There were seemingly no grownups anywhere in any of the rooms. I mean, it's quite incredible when you see a lot of these things that took place, right? And of course that, um, I mean, what, based on your experience, right? Is it what drives people to overlook some of these things? Is it FOMO? Is it the, the fear of losing out? Is it really, they say, ah, oh, it's just crypto. It's very different. Based on your experience, what are the, the triggers that force people to close their eyes on some of these failures or gaps? Um, some of it is a lack of imagination about people can, bad people can do bad things that, that I think it's human nature to try to think the best of people. Um, and I think the people who tend to go in operational due diligence tend to be a little bit more jaded and a little bit more willing to, to say, show me, I, I don't believe you until you show me. Um, so we are naturally skeptical and, and I think that healthy skepticism is important too. Um, I think that there is a little FOMO, but it's not so much FOMO like, um, People, I think of that term as you know, going to a great party or going somewhere because something wonderful is going to happen that that you want to be able to put it up on your social media. I think this was some of it was FTX was the biggest one of the biggest games in town. Binance and FTX and a few of the others are the biggest games in town. So if you are going to be trading a billion dollars, two billion dollars in digital assets, you can't go to the smallest exchanges. You have to play in the biggest exchanges to move capital, and you're willing to overlook risk to affect your business. And you're saying, I need to be on the top five or the top 10 exchanges because I'm trading a lot and I need to go where the volume is. Well, and then that's what happened, right? So it is sometimes the limitations of the marketplace. Some people want to barrel through the limitations of the marketplace. No, no one can go out there and put on a, a bid or an offer of make up a number, a thousand Bitcoin right now without moving the market. Well, you can't sit there and say, well, I want to do it. I don't care. I want to put an, I want to offer a thousand Bitcoin for sale. You're going to make the market go down. It, it is the limitation of the market and you have to understand the limitations of the market and you have to play within those, those as much as you don't wish there to be restrictions, there are. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and maybe quickly on this one, like, you know, obviously there's a lot of institutional investors are listening to the show. They can hire services firms like yours and others to do this specialized due diligence. But let's say my mom, you know, the regular retail person is, is wants to buy some crypto and has a choice between five, six different exchanges that, he's, that he or she sees based on a Google search. What is, let's say, the, the one thing they should look out for? As a, as a retail investor, they can take a look at it and say, okay, this makes sense. This doesn't make sense from a due diligence perspective. So if a retail investor wants to hold digital assets, personal opinion again, um, and, and I hope I don't get hate mail from from digital asset managers. I, I, I'm very ac uh, interested in when ETFs and mutual funds and other types of things, because you can get natural diversification at the modest amount of money. If you had $10,000 to invest, it's hard to um, develop a, a portfolio of, of diversification uh, of digital assets. So I um, am excited for the day when there are more and better ETFs or mutual funds that people can choose to invest in. Uh, short of that, um, I would stay with the larger, uh, more liquid uh, um, digital assets. I would prefer to move them into a thumb drive or, or a, you know, some type of a of a wallet of, of one type or another, uh, unless you're planning to be a day trader or something like that. So there is safety and security with the understanding that if you lose the thumb drive or if you lose your, 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 you know, your, your keys, um, there's a risk there. So if, if, it, if the person, um, wants to do it, I recommend they buy a small amount of a couple of different, uh, digital assets and learn, um, and, and learn what makes them go up and down and what they related to. And, and, and anybody who's buying blind, it says, I'm just going to buy two or three of them and see what happens. I think that's fool's, uh, fool's errand because you really need to begin to understand the marketplace. Absolutely. Before we move on to the final round of questions with my bell, I uh, just yep. want to ask you quite one last question, John. I mean, obviously you've done due diligence on a lot of crypto companies. What is the craziest thing you've seen on, on a, on a like absurd violation of basic due diligence uh, principles? Uh, um, we were asked to do a due diligence on a particular manager, and this is less than a year ago. So an organization uh, re that uh, I knew reached out to me. This is probably not the most absurd, but it's up there. Um, they said, hi, we're interested in doing a, a due diligence on this organization. Do you have you know, your staff capable? You're ready to go. And I said, yep, sure. Send me the name. Um, 
I looked at the uh, the name of the firm. I looked at the principles. I did a quick Google search and found out that one of the principles um, within the last two years had ma been materially fined, censured, and barred from the industry for improper activities uh, in the alternatives. So that ODD, I, I sent the person back an email within probably about 25 or 30 minutes after they asked me to kick off the, before even reaching out to the manager, I said, you are aware, aren't you, that one of the people just paid a multi-million dollar fine for improper trading activities and other types of things from the SEC, and they're currently barred from the industry. And I got back a, a note and said, no, we were not aware of that. Stop the ODD. So that ODD wow. project lasted about 20, 25 minutes. Wow. <laughs> um, and, and I've, seen, I've seen people who uh, in 2018 um, who had, were using falsified um, you know, returns. And uh, I reached out to one organization and um, it took me about an hour of questioning to figure out that something was wrong and the person was really sweating. And I figured out that, that one of their traders had gone rogue. It didn't take me long to pu start pushing on their controls and had lost about two and a half million dollars trading. And, and they had just uncovered days before the person's trading and had lost two and a half million dollars rogue trading. And they were hoping that I would uh, um, not focus on that, uh, which, of course, I did. And the last one, I went to do an ODD during the uh, the correction when Bitcoin went from 18,000 down to 3,000. And I was asked to do a due diligence and I arrived in uh, Spain and uh, my phone lit up and the manager said, don't bother coming over. And I said, why? He said, we're down 85%. <laughs> so I'd flown all the way to, to Spain, uh, flown to Madrid, and they left me a message that said, don't bother coming for the ODD. I was in town, so I went and talked with them anyways. Yeah, yeah. But um, it was a it was a more general conversation because, like I said, they were down eighty five percent. That's incredible. I'm sure you guys must have a lot of stories. I think it's just nature of the uh, the profession, right? Is getting a lot of this uh, this intel. Well, John, uh, we're already way ahead of time. I'm going to bring my bellas with me. I'm going to ask you quick questions, and I want like a, a quick answer, one or two word answer. Uh, and the bell is here to keep us honest. The bell is our due diligence uh, investigation. <laughs> uh, they can keep us honest and on time on that perspective. Are you ready? Yep. Let's I'll kick do it my off. best. John, so you mentioned you're a golfer. If you could golf at one course or one place in the world, where would you want to golf? Uh, Pebble Beach. Oh, here you go. Of course. Uh, who would you want to play golf with? If there's one person you can play golf with, who would you want to golf with? Uh, Tiger, wouldn't everybody love to see him hit the ball? Yeah, exactly. And his son as well. Right now, was a very incredible golfer as well. <laughs> the old Tiger. How, how about the Tiger from 10 years ago who yeah. had two working legs? <laughs> <laughs> so, John, uh, if you had to take a bet on Satoshi, do you think he's a man, woman, and which country is he, is he or is she from? I'm going to say it is a man, and I'm going to say they are uh, – Asian, uh, but not Japanese. I'm going to guess either Chinese, Malaysian, Singapore, that kind of thing. Interesting. John, if you're not in crypto, what other industry, or if you're not in due diligence or crypto, what industry would you be in? Um, I'd want to be on the other side, asset management, <laughs> uh, investing, the investing side of it. Um, if you had one piece of advice to anybody who's going through due diligence, what would that piece of advice be? Say what you do, do what you say. Yeah, very well um, nice. Because it, if people are going to, if you're lying, people are going to figure it out pretty quick. Yeah, well, that's always what I tell uh, younger people as well. Uh, what is the one skill or background you think is very useful for anybody who's doing due diligence? Um, body language, yeah. uh, reading people, uh, because when people, are, every, there's a lot of good liars out there, and you have to have good uh, good skills at understanding when people are lying to you. What advice do you give to anybody who wants to learn more about crypto? What resources or what he or she should do to learn more about the industry? Start looking at the marketplace like a coin market cap. Coin, and those places that, that are large uh, uh, holders of information are great places to start your, your travels. And then the next thing is start figuring out a cast of experts to listen to um, like yourself and say, look, I don't understand yet what he's saying, but I'm willing to listen. Yeah. Uh, education is the most important thing. And John, uh, to finish it off again, our session today, yep. uh, our typical question at the Future of Money podcast, John, if you could have lunch or dinner with one person dead or alive, lunch or dinner with one person dead or alive, who would you want to have lunch or dinner with? Oh, man. Um, maybe someone like Lincoln. Maybe wow. someone like uh, like an Abraham Lincoln. I, I think there's a lot of wisdom there. And, and 
learn from somebody who was going through some of the worst things in the whole wide world and kept his kept his feet underneath him and, and moved the world ahead. Yep. Definitely has left his mark. That was John John Ward, the managing director in the alternative assets advisory team at Kroll. John, if people want to find out more about you and the work you do in Kroll as well, where can, where can they find out more information? Um, Kroll has a, a website, obviously. Uh, you can go onto the website. You can search for digital assets uh, more broadly, and you can see all the different work that our firm does in the space of digital assets. You can also go on like search operational due diligence or search my name. I am on LinkedIn, John Ward uh, Kroll. I'm happy to talk with anybody. And the last thing I'll say to any organization, build a network of people that you trust that you can talk to, whether it's me. There's a lot of really great ODD people in the world use their use their time use their expertise use their experience and and help protect and safeguard clients assets that that's the most important thing yeah absolutely i think it's so important i think it's unfortunate like you mentioned at the start uh, one area of uh, of investing i think a lot of people uh, overlook especially when it comes to the digital the digital assets it's actually when it comes to dd in particular or odd uh, which is very very important john thank you it astounds very- me how many large organizations are willing to write a hundred million dollar check and do almost no odd yeah. it, it's astounding that they won't spend ten thousand dollars when they're about to write a check for a hundred million I, I don't understand it but there's a lot of places that do it absolutely and we saw the effects of some of them recently with some of the recent collapses right so yeah, a lot of people went as they say when the tide went out there's a lot of people that got caught uh with out bathing suits on FTX. Exactly. Well, John, thank you very much again. Thank you very much, everybody. Hope this was insightful. Again, we're going to have more episodes on this investor series over the next couple of weeks, so stay tuned. And again, if you want to see more exclusive content of, of the future of money, including the crypto capsules, make sure to check out my YouTube page as well, uh, now available in multiple languages as well. Just look for Henry R. Slanian. Thank you very much, everybody, and, and uh, see you all soon for another episode of the Future of Money podcast. See you guys soon.